When people look at fossil sharks, they're often looking at very recent ones, things like Otodus megalodon because it was absolutely massive, or even going back to the Cretaceous, just things like Cretoxyrhina, which is also known as the Ginsu shark because its teeth were pretty sharp, kind of like Ginsu knives are today. However, there's a lot of diversity that we actually do see in the fossil record that's not often recognized. And admittedly, not all of these are sharks, but the Paleozoic had some really, really wild animals. In fact, when we look back into the Paleozoic, we see some very, very strange forms of sharks and shark relatives. Things with very strange fins, long whip-like tendrils, and some of them had strange jaws, and then some of them on top of that had even stranger jaws. So what was going on with all of these sharks? So today, sharks are just one part of the Elasmobranchii, which actually includes things like rays, skates, and also sawfish. However, they were definitely one of the first parts to really become defined within Elasmobranchii, and they evolved very early on, potentially as far back as the Ordovician, 450 million years ago. This makes them literally older than trees, older than the first trees ever to grow on land. Unfortunately, most of the fossils that we do get of sharks from this time period are pretty partial and are actually of the scales because the scales are denticles, essentially they're teeth that grow on the skin. And this helps make sharks more hydrodynamic so they can swim through the water faster and with more ease. But during the Devonian is when the first really good body fossils of sharks start to show up with animals like Cladosache, which would have been about six feet long or around two meters and had a very distinctive spine by the front dorsal fin. And so this is one of the things that a lot of these early sharks had, partially because the Devonian, although being the age of fishes, sharks still weren't the dominant fish. In fact, one of the formations that Cladosace has been found in is the Cleveland Shale, and that also includes a much larger predator, Dunkleosteus, which could have gotten up to 20 feet long, or about six meters. It was a placoderm, meaning it had very hard bony plates throughout its skull. In fact, the bone actually formed massive shearing plates on the front of the jaws, and so it absolutely could have tried to eat any cladosace it came upon. However, maybe that spine was able to essentially help defend it. If the Dunkleosteus couldn't quite close itself without getting stabbed by that spine, maybe that's how these early sharks were able to essentially escape and able to survive up until the placoderms like Dunkleosteus went extinct. And once the placoderms like Dunkleosteus died out, some other forms of shark were actually able to do very, very successfully, such as the hybodontiforms and the tenacanthiforms both of which evolved in the Devonian and survived up until the impact that killed off the dinosaurs. So a time period of almost 400 million years that they were just hanging around in the oceans. However, they weren't entirely successful. One of the largest of these Paleozoic sharks was called Dracopristorus hoffmanorum, and it was nicknamed the Godzilla shark by the people who found it. And like Godzilla, it had large spines on its back, but unlike Godzilla, it only got to seven feet long. So just barely over two meters. So although these two lineages were very successful, even surviving the Permian-Triassic extinction that happened 252 million years ago and killed off 95% of life in the oceans, they still weren't necessarily quite as big as we think of sharks being today. Certainly nowhere near being the same kinds of apex predators that we think of in modern day oceans. However, there was also one group of sharks that absolutely became the apex predators in their environment, but they were in a freshwater environment. And today, we, there are some sharks that do go into freshwater, most famously the bull shark, which absolutely would be an apex predator in most river systems. But the freshwater Xenocanthedons seem to have spent even more time in freshwater than even the modern day bull shark. In fact, one genus, Orthocanthus, was so dominant that it could make up up to 40% of some freshwater communities. So it was essentially everywhere. But on top of this, it was also an incredible, incredibly voracious predator with very solid evidence of cannibalism occurring in this animal. And this is all based on fossilized coprolites, which is essentially fossilized poop. And there's also really solid evidence that this potentially could have been some of the pressures that caused some animals to flee onto land, including some of the first ancestors to tetrapods, which includes every land-based vertebrate today. Some of those coprolites that I mentioned earlier also had tetrapod material in them meaning that Orthocanthus was hunting some of the first fish to start walking onto land. And this essentially just means that Orthocanthus and the other Xenocanthedons may have been a very important factor in the evolution of life on land. Eventually though, this would come to bite them in the butt. And that's because many of these life forms that moved to land eventually took over river systems, especially immediately after the Permian-Triassic extinction, when many early kinds of reptiles started to move back into the water and essentially start to dominate many of those ecosystems. This, on top of the just general ecosystem collapse that occurred during the end Permian, 
helps to suggest that these are the reasons that the Xenanthidans did eventually go extinct. But there was another group that didn't fare well during the Permian-Triassic extinction. And they actually are still around today, just in very low numbers compared to what they were like during the Paleozoic. And they're not quite sharks, technically. They're just very, very close. In fact, they're the closest living relatives to the modern-day elasmobranchii, which, like I mentioned earlier, does include sharks, rays, skates, and sawfish. And they're very, very different looking today. And that's because they look like this. They've been given many different names, including chimera, ratfish, or ghostfish. One of the main things that researchers use to try and identify these in the fossil record are essentially which parts of the cartilage in the skull actually articulate with the jaw and actually move in the jaw. So this is one of the main things researchers have used to understand which fossils in the past are or aren't true sharks. These are the holocephalians, and together with the elasmobranchs, they form a single group, the chondrichthys. And these are essentially all cartilaginous fish, so fish with cartilage skeletons instead of bony skeletons. And before the sharks really rose to dominance during the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, these were the most dominant predators in many of the oceans. Now that's not to say they were all top predators. Some of them, like Deltotus, were very, very closely related to the Chimeras, and they actually had relatively similar teeth and probably were doing a lot of the same things, essentially crushing up different mollusks and shells and eating what was inside. But there were still others, such as Sethacanthus, which had a shark-like tail, a shark-like head, except for this kind of texture on the top of it, and then, you know, a fin that was a brush and two long ribbons coming off its pectoral fins. As long as you ignore that middle part, it's still pretty close. These brush-like fins and textures were probably to essentially help the male and female stay in close contact during mating. However, these strange fins still aren't as strange as those on Falcatus, which had a very strange forward-pointing fin, but only in the males. This is something we can actually tell with all chondrichthians, so long as there's decent soft tissue preservation. And that's because male chondrichthys have what are called claspers. And it's essentially it's just two extra fins that help to clasp onto the female during mating. And again, only the males have this. And there's many specimens of falcatus which don't have the fin on top, but also don't have these claspers. So we can tell very distinctly that there was sexual dimorphism in the species falcatus. These were all relatively small though, reaching maybe three feet or about a meter. And there's one other group of relatively small holocephalian I want to mention before I get to the much larger ones. So you can stay tuned for that. There are going to be ones that were much more dominant. While there have already been some strange holocephalians and sharks in this video, there's one more that's probably even stranger, and those are the Ineopterygian forms. And these may actually be the strangest ones. Unfortunately, they're poorly studied, but they may have actually flown, or flown at least as well as any modern fish does. Like modern flying fish, their pectoral fins were moved very high up the body and were relatively long, at least in some species. So there's some chance that like flying fish, they may have essentially taken to the air to escape from predators. Unlike modern flying fish though, which are all very peaceful filter feeders, they actually had some pointed teeth. And while these are still relatively small teeth, it does mean that the Ineopterygia forms were still very active predators and would have hunted smaller fish. That said, they weren't very large themselves, maybe getting up to two feet, so less than a meter. So while the size is comparable to many modern day flying fish, there's at least some features that seem a little bit off. For example, some of the wings don't seem necessarily quite as long as those in modern day flying fish. Although that could just be a preservation issue where maybe they did have longer wings or larger fins and we just haven't found that part yet. The other thing is their tail isn't necessarily the same shape and this might seem unimportant, but when you look at fast swimming fish, they generally have forked tails and this includes things like the flying fish, which need that forked tail to get up to speed so that they can leave the water and try and escape predators. The Ineopterygians, though, had a very rounded tail. Like, it almost looks like a pancake. It's a very strange adaptation, and it's still not entirely clear why they had this adaptation. So while there have been a lot of comparisons to flying fish, there's still a lot we don't actually know about this group, other than they were incredibly, incredibly bizarre. So if you're someone who actually wants to go out and study fish fossils and even some relatives of sharks, this is a very good group to start on because there's a lot of work to be done because we don't really understand them that well. And finally, we're gonna talk about some of these ratfish relatives that aren't quite small. In fact, some of these got to comparable sizes as the modern day great white shark, getting to about 20 feet long or about six meters, as large as Dunkleosteus before it. The two genera we're gonna talk about are Adestus and Helicoprion, both of which had relatively similar feeding strategies with relatively shark-like bodies, at least starting from the back, but then getting up to the skull where their very strange tooth whorl showed up. And to describe what a tooth whorl is, it's essentially just an arcing row of teeth. 
It's really hard to try and say which one of these two is actually more strange looking because they're both very strange looking. In Destus, it had tooth whorls on the top and bottom jaws, and these were essentially partial whorls, at least compared to Helicoprion. This gave it almost a puckered lips look. And then Helicoprion, I mean, on the surface, it does look more normal, but then you realize it doesn't have any teeth in the top jaw. And then on the bottom jaw, while it does look like it has just a single small whorl, that whorl actually spirals all the way down. So it still had a very, very interesting jaw system, as much as it looks potentially more normal on the outside. For a long time, it was actually really hard to try and identify what Helicoprion actually looked like. And that's because for the most part, all we had was the spiral tooth whorls, and we couldn't necessarily place where they were in the animal's head. And this led to many strange and bizarre reconstructions of Helicoprion, with tooth whorls in all kinds of places. But eventually, some researchers found one that had some of the jaw and skull cartilage preserved, and this A helped us understand what it would have looked like, and B was one of the main features that helped us understand that these animals weren't actually sharks, but were holocephalians, based on some of the way the cartilages in the lower jaw and the upper jaw connect. And as to the purpose of these strange tooth whorls, it has to do with their prey, which was actually some of the most common animals in the Paleozoic Oceans, and that's the ammonites. And you might be thinking ammonites had hard shells. How did they eat these without, you know, the same kind of blunt and crushing dentition that we see in a lot of the other holocephalians. Well, they essentially just sucked the animals out of their shells. Now, it's technically not fair to say they were sucking them out of their shells. There was not really any suction involved. Instead, the scissor-like jaws of Edestus would pinch the animal, and as the animal closed its mouth further, would rotate and help to pull the animal further back into the mouth of Edestus, and then it would get eaten. Helicoprion was slightly different because it had a gap in the upper jaw. The same basic principle applied though, with the ammonite getting pinched into this gap in the upper jaw and then dragged back into the stomach. So while these animals were as large as some of the modern day great whites, they weren't necessarily eating in the same way because a lot of those same prey items hadn't necessarily showed up in the oceans though. And it's still very likely that Helicoprion and Adestus did feed on other prey than just ammonites, but their jaws were very specialized for it. And this meant that once the Permian-Triassic extinction happened, they were really, really struggling because the Permian-Triassic extinction made a very big dent in the diversity and the numbers of ammonites. And at some point they did recover, but it was very slow recovery. And during this very slow recovery, the Eugenodontids did die out. And unfortunately, many sharks are struggling today. And that essentially means it's up to people like you and me to try and help raise awareness about this and hopefully try and get some action done to help preserve their environments. Sharks and their relatives have been around for at least 450 million years. And during that time, they've influenced a lot of evolution in a lot of different groups, not just their own bizarre fossil history. For example, again, the Xenanchithidans potentially influenced our own move to land. But then even closer to the modern day, great whites influence how a lot of different marine mammals interact with the water. There's a long fossil history of sharks playing an important role in many marine ecosystems, and we really shouldn't let them go extinct. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Yeah, there's some bizarre stuff out there. I would love to get more into some of the bizarre uh, Paleozoic sharks in a little bit more detail, potentially next year for, for uh, next year's Shark Week. I do want to mention again, a friend of mine and my wife and I are starting a podcast. It's, you know, me knowing about paleontology, my wife knowing paleontology vicariously through me, my friend who knows nothing talking about some of these topics. So there's gonna be a lot of kind of off the cuff learning about paleontology essentially. With that in mind, everyone, be safe, take care, wear a mask, don't let the sharks go extinct, and let's not go extinct either.